I'd like to thank the organisers for giving me this chance to share Rose's work with the wider audience. This paper will consider the photographic practice undertaken by Rose Comiskey's, Comiskey, whose images of street protests depict the major issues affecting Irish women in the late 20th century. Spanning from 1982 to 1992, they reflect challenging times during which issues such as abortion, the anti-apartheid movement and travellers' rights were urged through collective action on streets of Dublin. Comiskey was part of the women's movement and her images provide a record and bear witness to its activities. Working independently from the mainstream media, her black and white photos have a particular resonance for contemporary activists whose long fight for reproductive rights culminated in the repeal of the constitutional amendment prohibiting abortion in 2018. I will give an overview of her practice and how she worked within the male-dominated terrain of street photography. Comiskey was not a photojournalist working on commission. Rather, she photographed the various collectives and women's groups in which she often played an active part. Her portrayal counters the stereotypical images of Irish women and differs from those created by international photographers for consumption outside of the country. This paper is informed by an in-depth interview I undertook with the photographer, and it reveals that the dissemination and reception of her work was influenced by the collective ethos that permeated the women's movement during these decades. Following a referendum in 1983, the Irish electorate voted in favour of an amendment to, to the constitution prohibiting abortion. This gave the fetus equal rights to that of the mother. Immediately after this, attempts were also made to prevent information being made available to, on abortion services that could be obtained in England. As Comiskey recalls, and I quote, from the moment the referendum was passed, the forces of the right kept trying to make it more and more difficult to get information. I have one of our banners which says, women's right to know. Images such as this one, showing a large scale puppet of a male judge, are a valuable record of a vibrant street life lived in the public realm. Comiskey's photographs reveal the dynamism and creativity inherent in activism, be that through handmade banners, puppets, innovative street art and performance. This slide shows the cover of magazine Roundup, which uses a photograph by Comiskey. It was published by the Women's Centre on Dame Street, Dublin, where she also worked. Its contents reflect the concerns of second wave feminism. Published between 1983 and 1985, it included articles on women's health, childcare, divorce, equal pay, and it offered writing workshops, lectures, meeting rooms, helplines, and assertiveness training. Dublin lectures by Mary Daly, Andrea Dworkin, and Julie Birchall were reported upon. Numerous courses were offered, including one based on the book Fat is a Feminist Issue, which recommended that all attendees should have read the 1978 Susan Orbach title before attending the course. Roundup's edi editors emphasise that, and I quote from the magazine, the centre itself is non-political, meaning that it does not take stand on political issues or support any groups involved in political campaigns. Instead, the editors saw themselves as a conduit for information, dissemination, and a pooling of resources and facilities. Access to the means of production were egalitarian and non-profit. Photography lessons and darkroom rentals were offered both at the Women's Centre and at the Dublin Resource Centre with lower rates for the unwaged. Sharing of skills and knowledge was very much at the fore of the centre's aims. Comiskey is keen to emphasise that her images were produced and circulated out of the outside of the mainstream media. As such, this gave her an autonomy which those, lacking in that which those working on commissions lacked. She had attained her photographic skills through classes offered at Polytechnics whilst living in London, where she worked in bookshops and publishing and was an active member of the squatting movement. The skills, both photographic and organisational, which she gained during this period were put to use upon her return to Dublin. Indeed, the transferal of skills from one place of activism to another is integral to many social reform movements, be it from the Northern Irish Civil Rights Movement to Greenham Common, or in Comiskey's case, from the London squatting scene to Dublin's reproductive rights campaigns. Comiskey describes her photographic skills as having been picked up along the way. And whilst this could be viewed as a drawback, it also offers creative freedom. 
She wasn't pigeonholed or directed towards a particular aesthetic. Inspiration was gleaned from the photo books she encountered in the various shops where she worked. And this is evidence of the photo book in the dissemination of taste and its influence upon photographers. This slide shows a 1992 trip called The Sistership, which was organized by the Women's Coalition Group. It supported the estimate 100 Irish women who traveled to Ireland every week for an abortion. In addition to working for the, in the print co-op at the Dublin Resource Centre and the Women's Centre, Kumuski was also involved in an illegal helpline which offered abortion information to women. A series of cases throughout the 1980s and 1990s revealed the harshness and inhumanity of the legislation and each generated a wave of new protest. Kumuski's photographs form Kumsky's photographs record the incremental changes that led to the landmark 2018 decision, and they showed protests calling for the right to information, the right to travel, and the right to save clinics. Her visual record and validation of this long struggle for reproductive rights is vital in the face of the self-congratulatory and audacious manner in which the government, who were reluctant participants in the quest for reform, placed themselves at the centre of the events marking the repeal in 2018. When do people mobilise socially? What are the conditions that allow this to happen? Vale and Holland, in the discussion of the Amber Film and Photography Collective, ask the following questions. Are there social periods where oppositional culture, culture rather than political opportunities are the most propitious? And what is the main factors that combine to produce this? The importance of the Temple Bar area of Dublin as a hub and site for creative, political and cooperative activities during this period cannot be underestimated. Prior to the so-called regeneration and development of the area, which indeed destroyed much of its vibrancy, this small urban enclave housed a high concentration of political and creative activity. By the 1980s, the council's plan to level and demolish the area to make way for a bus station was in abeyance, and this resulted in cheap rents. Spacious warehouse buildings became available to artists and co-ops, and these included Temple Bar Galleries, the Project Arts Centre, the Attic Feminist Press, the Dublin Resource Centre, where Kumsky ran the print co-op, the Hirschfield Gay Rights Centre, and the Women's Centre, where Kumsky also volunteered. In many ways, the conditions which facilitated the activity mirror those which, according to Mark Fisher, enabled the flourishing of post-punk music in various English cities. There were the opening up of free second level education, low rents, adequate social welfare payments, combined with a collective mentality. Gavin Butt, with reference to the Leeds art and music scene of the same time, applies the notion of the commons to the city, whereby sharing the econo economics of production facilitated groupings which had a transformative potential. Kumuski notes, and I quote, we printed magazines ourselves, and some of my photographs were used in these. We did a gay rights magazine, there were a lot of artists around Temple Bar then. Temple Bar was quite a centre for political activity and we took it all for granted that it would continue. Then the capitalist giants moved in. I don't know what happened there. The property boom did. The thing was, Temple Bar was going to be a bus station, then it was going to be a cultural centre and there's very little left of that. According to McAdam, Taro and Tilly, groups and movements seeking social change shield themselves from the mainstream and gain benefits from, from seeking out links with other like-minded organisations. This observation is particularly apt for the groups, co-ops and galleries operating in the small section of the city in the 1980s. Kumsky's role in the DRC and Women's Resource Centre meant that she was ideally positioned to know about the various movements and protests that were taking place in the city. I was, I was, and I quote, I was turning up at marches, taking photographs, and I was sometimes the only photographer there, and I just kept going on. This image shows a street view of, Dun of the Dunn Store's anti-apartheid strike in Dublin. In July 1984, Mary Manning, a shop worker in the Henry Street outlet of Dunn Stores, refused to handle the sale of grapefruit from South Africa. Her union had issued direct directions to its members not to handle South African produce. Um, when Manning and Shop Stewart continued to refuse to handle South African produce, they were suspended and 10 members working in the store went on strike. The strike lasted until April 1987, 
and the Irish government, when the Irish government banned the import of South African goods. The ban came as a result of public pressure in support of the strikers and was the first complete ban of South African goods by a Western government. The outlet for Comiskey's photographs was small-scale exhibitions at the Dublin Resource Centre or in cafes around town. Our photographs were also included in the magazines, fanzines and leaflets produced by the various groups using the co-op. Interestingly, she notes that press photography was something that wasn't available to her as a woman, stating, and I quote, it wasn't that I wasn't interested in becoming a press photographer, I just didn't see a way of becoming one. I felt it was a world cut off from me. Irish travellers are a traditionally itinerant ethnic group and the following two slides cover protests which reflect their concerns. Life expectancy for this cohort remains low and incar incarceration rates are high. This slide shows a 1984 protest of bareback riders passing the National Parliament. They were mobilised against new restrictions on horse ownership which impacted upon their culture. The location of Carl's Kildare Street is repeated on several of Comiskey's are in several pieces of Comiskey's archive and as evidence of the street is a locus for protest and a site for spectacle and action. This slide relates to the travelling community and shows two women from that group speaking outside the general post office, a place which has a deep resonance for Ireland's struggle for independence and autonomy. Comiskey was keen to stress that these women were known to her and this intimacy and familiarity um, meant that she was not confronted with the difficult encounters and hostility faced by some street photographers. While she was keen to stress that most people mostly, she mostly asked permission before picturing them, she also noted that these people wanted to be photographed as part of this collective action. Although Comiskey remains active within the women's movement, with regard to photographing on the street, she states, I can't do it as much anymore. I have lost that, and photography has changed. It all depends upon what kind of street photographer you are and whether you have a political bent or not. It was easier then, I think. In June 1984, the then President of the United States of America, Ronald Reagan, visited Ireland addressing the Parliament, Dáil Éireann, and visiting his ancestral home in Ballyporeen, County Tipperary. The pervasive mainstream media images of this event placed an emphasis, emphasis upon the traditional Irish welcome that he received and showing sipping the obligatory pint of Guinness at the local pub. However, many were against this visit and for a variety of reasons, mainly linked to the United States foreign policy and nuclear proliferation. Comiskey photographed these protests at locations across Dublin. Her images show banners refer referencing Nicaragua, El Salvador and the Philippines. The ongoing deployment of cruise mi nuclear missiles in Europe also featured. Protesters, some encased in paper mache cruise missiles, descend descended upon the American embassy and locations where Regan was due to visit. The current Irish president, Michael D. Higgins, then a government minister, refused to meet with him. Protesters formed a circle around Dublin Castle on the evening that Regan attended a state banquet. Indeed, many of the tactics and protest actions were borrowed from the women camping at, camping at the Royal Air Force American base at Green, Green and Common, Newbury, England. This encircling of a site as a form of direct action and symbolic process, protest was a tactic much employed by the women protesting at Greenham most notably in attempts to embrace the base, which took place in December 1982. As Lewer notes in her study of the camp, the Greenham women used their bodies to rhetorically cha challenge the real and symbolic boundary markers that the base represented. In addition to encircling Dublin Castle, a group of women camped outside the American ambassador's residence in Phoenix Park. Their activities are described in Roundup, the magazine produced by Comiskey, and I quote, I was among the 60 or so women who set up a peace camp in the Phoenix Park. During the days we were there, we engaged in such sinister activities as making flowers, playing with children and dogs, weaving webs in trees with wool, painting our faces, and sewing a quarter mile long patchwork snake. The role of women, Irish women in the Green, in the Green and Common protests requires further exploration as does their subsequent application of feminist protest tactics in the fight for reproductive rights. 
Comiskey has recently received attention through the publication of her photographs by the independent UK publisher Craig Atkinson's Café Royal Books and Photo Ireland's Library Project. Atkinson has previously published Jane Wydell's Greenham, Greenham Conham, Common photographs and her Berkeley riot images. These acts of retrieval follow on from a 2013 exhibition of Comiskey's images of reproductive rights protests entitled Against the Tide. Indeed, the title of this panel, In and Out of the Museum, Museum is germane in any discussion of Comiskey's work. In relation to exhibition opportunities during the 1980s, she reported that she felt a little intimidated by the Gallery of Photography in the sense that they were doing exhibitions of art. It was art photography, and that wasn't the area I was in. This eschewing of the gallery in favour of non-traditional art spaces were perhaps in keeping with the democratising and egalitarian aims of the co-ops. It is also worth no noting that Comiskey's work was regenerated by small independent publishers. Um, indeed, the National Gallery of Ireland has only this month had its first exhibition of photography, and the Gallery of Photography, whilst that has shifted its emphasis to away from fine art um, to consider photojournalism and documentary, is not a collecting institute. This, these omissions, however, do not necessarily perturb the photographer, reveals that the model and distribution of Atkinson's Café Royal books is in keeping with the spirit in which the work was made. I will finish with the photographer's own world, words. I felt it was my contribution, and I also wanted to remind people of the earlier generation to show how we did it and how we could continue on. There is a lot more film and photography of the 1970s activist, activists, and there, there is a little bit of a gap in the record from then on. I knew that it would be an interesting thing to look at.